But in both cases, what we're seeing is we're seeing the star change, right? We don't actually see the planet. We have to infer that it's there from what we see the star with. But, um, and so that's great. There's a lot of people who work on that. That's actually what I did my PhD thesis on, was finding planets. Um, but you might ask, what happens after we find an exoplanet, right? So this is a transit of a planet, a simulated transit, of a planet like the Earth in front of the sun, right? So we're going along, the sun's going along, the Earth passes in front of it, it goes down, it comes back up, um, and you see that there's a planet there. And you can use that to measure the planet's size. This would tell us that this planet is the same radius as the Earth. And we could use the Wapple method to measure a mass, say, and learn that it's the mass of the Earth. But the problem is, if we thought about doing this on our solar system, we could make this look at our solar system from another star and do this measurement. Um, you know, we would see this, we'd say, great, we found a planet the same mass, radius as Earth, and the right distance from its star to be a nice place to live. But we'd get that twice. We'd see Earth, and we'd also see Venus. Right? In our solar system, Venus is almost the exact same mass and radius as Earth, and it's at about the right distance where we think planets can still be habitable and be conducive to life. Right? So if we did this on the solar system, we'd say the solar system had two habitable planets. What we want to do is figure out from something like this is the planet we're looking at a nice beach vacation or is it something that's going to melt your spacecraft 30 minutes after it touches down? Right? The Soviets landed two spacecraft on Venus. They only survived for about 30 minutes before they got destroyed hmm. on the surface. Actually, in this one, this is a good story. Um, the first one they landed uh, wasn't able to take pictures because the lens cap got stuck on the camera. <laughs> it didn't come off. And so the it was so hot? Or, like, do they know... Why? I don't think they were able to, they weren't really able to figure out why, because okay. it, like I said, it got destroyed 30 minutes later. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So the second one, they made sure the lens cap was going to come off, right? So they're drifting down with a parachute about 10 feet up, they pop the lens cap off, it works, and everybody's high-fiving. And then maybe like 10 minutes later, because they're on the clock, right, they have a, an experiment where there's a spring-loaded arm that the catch releases, the spring shoots the arm out into the ground, it's going to collect some soil and it retracts back in. And it can only operate once, right? Because they've coiled the spring and it's on a catch. Right? They can't redo this after it fires. And so they uh, release the catch, spring fires, arm shoots out directly into the lens cap, which has landed right next to the spacecraft. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and so they didn't end up getting any. That's the story of why we don't actually have any direct measurements of what we just as surface is like. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, right, but this is the game, right? This is what, this is actually fundamentally what I work on, right? Is once we've found planets, I mean, how do we figure out if they're like the Earth or if they're like Venus, even if their mass and radiuses are pretty much exactly the same. So one of the ways we do this is we use those transiting exoplanets that pass in front of the star. Because when the planet passes in front of the star, the atmosphere actually imprints on that starlight, right? So the planet's going in front of it that has an atmosphere around it. You can imagine there's like a Imagine there's a planet here, and there's a fuzzy layer of air around it. And so as the planet goes in front of the star, most of the planet's blocking the star, but that fuzzy layer of air is letting some starlight through. And as that starlight passes through that fuzzy outer, outer layer of air, what's in the air imprints on that starlight. So we can measure that. So we can measure what's in the planet's atmosphere, even though we, can't, we never actually see the planet itself. Uh, and this is where the James Webb Space Telescope comes in. Uh, has anybody heard of this? Yeah. Um, that's nice. Not everybody, it's a small audience, but not everybody raises their hand for that. Uh, so launch was uh, Christmas morning of uh, 21, 2021. Um, so before I started work at UW, I worked for four years as an instrument scientist on one of the there were four cameras. James Webb, and so I worked on one of them called Near Camp. Uh, and so Christmas morning, I have two children, and we did presents for about half an hour, and then uh, watched the launch. And we were on, like, I actually had access to, like, the internal comms, like, through the internet, so I could listen to everything, and we were watching on NASA TV, and we were all on a video call together. Um, and my mother-in-law, 
was very nice. Her name was Cindy. Uh, we were at their house. Uh, realized that this was a big moment for my career, right? If this blew up, well actually, if it blew up, it would have made a lot of people's careers problematic, but it would have been a real problem for me. Um, and as always with rocket launches, there's a real threat that that's gonna happen, right? Uh, and uh, so the whole rocket launch is like a 30 minute affair, and uh, the spacecraft has to, the rocket has to launch, the stages have to separate, the spacecraft has to detach from the upper stage, and then the solar panel has to come out because the batteries only last for 20 minutes. If the solar panel doesn't come out, you have 20 minutes to figure out what's going on and then you're dead. Right? So there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen in this 30 minutes after launch. And my mother-in-law uh, thought that if we were 10 seconds in and the rocket was flying and everything was going great, we were done. Uh, and so like 10 seconds in, she was like, Thomas, they like it's working, they did it. I was like, God, not, not now, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but so that was my Christmas uh, a couple years ago. I was working on that. Um, I'll just say the, the thing that's really cool to me about Web, it's, it's actually a pretty amazing machine. But one of the cool things is that Web's mirror is about three times larger than Hubble's, so meaning it can collect about 10 times as much light. It's like 10 times more sensitive, but the mirror weighs only half as much. Right? It's 10 times as much area, but the weight is only half as much as Hubble, which to me is sort of an amazing statistic. Um, the other difference with Hubble is that it's an infrared telescope, right? So Hubble observed mainly in the visual, in the optical, like with what we can see with our eyes, a little bit into the infrared. But Webb is really a dedicated infrared telescope, so it observes at much longer wavelengths of light than we can see with our eyes. Which is also to say, when you see pictures from Webb, and they have these nice colors, they're not colors you can actually see. Right? We can't actually see the light that is making pictures. That's all colorized afterwards by people at NASA and at, um, somewhere in uh, Baltimore, the control room, to make it look nice. But one thing this does let us do is it allows us to see really deep into planetary atmospheres. Right? So this is an infrared picture of Jupiter. You can see the great red spot right there. Right? And what you're seeing there is the dark spots are all the clouds, all the high clouds in Jupiter's atmosphere, and the brighter spots, the hotter spots, are way deep into Jupiter's atmosphere. So the temperature is increased by a couple of hundred degrees. So we're going deep into Jupiter's atmosphere using infrared light. So infrared light lets us see deeper into planetary atmospheres. And it lets us see different molecules. So Hubble, Hubble has done a lot of exoplanet atmosphere observations. It's measured a lot of exoplanets. But fundamentally, it only measures water. The only thing it can really measure easily is how much water is on the planet. Um, but Webb can do lots of other stuff. Methane, water, carbon dioxide, all sorts of molecules. Uh, which is very exciting because it actually gives us a much better idea of what's going on in one of these atmospheres. Um, uh, oh, and this is just some local color of what it was like. I spent um, the first six months of commissioning, just getting everything operational, checking out the spacecraft, making sure it worked. Uh, this was my desk for uh, like two months later, right? The neat thing is they have actually here, you'll see it's all green, right? They've thoughtfully realized that no person can actually look at this and understand it, so they just color code it. And if it goes, if it's green, it's fine. If it's yellow, like, you gotta pay attention. And if it's red, uh, then you gotta start calling something. Um, the other fun thing was, um, this was, we were all sitting in what was called the science operations room. This was uh, flight operations and flight ops. They were in their own room next to us. They actually controlled the spacecraft. Uh, you will note that flight ops at this moment is not actually paying attention. They're watching Olympic curling. <laughs> uh, I, one week I had to do a whole bunch of night shifts, which felt terribly unjust for a space telescope, but I had to stay up all night to uh, run it. And uh, most of what we did on those night shifts was just flight ops were put on movies. Uh, and we were just watching uh, through the glass while they watched movies. Uh, they, the week I was there, they went, chose all the Princess Diaries movies, uh, which I had never seen before. Thought it was a strong choice. Um, okay, so how can we use JWST to search for life? You know, with this giant space telescope. Um, you know, often when we think about uh, other life in the universe, like when we think about movies, usually what we think about is other intelligence. Right? We think about like, Vulcans, or we think about aliens, or we think about something, right? But really, 
Like, that would be amazing. Right? If we could find intelligent life, I'm pretty, there's not really a way to win in science, but I'm pretty sure that if I could find intelligent life, I would win a strong right? <laughs> um, But we don't only think about intelligent life, we think about other kinds of life. Right? We think about bacteria, we think about plants, we think about animals, and we think about how they alter the, the planet that they're on, and can we see that alteration? Um, I will say that the, the exact definition of what life is isn't really clear cut. I've been to a lot of conferences where people get into real arguments about what is life and what isn't. Particularly if we're trying to measure really fine signals, right? What's the dividing line between something that's just a bunch of chemistry and something that's biological? Um, it's probably something like, right, with self-organized chemical structure that alters the environment that's also sort of a great general state. So there's a lot of discussion right now about what exactly life is. Um, on Earth, the main building block of life is DNA, right? Inside every single uh, organism on Earth, every single piece of life on Earth is some version of DNA, uh, which is fundamentally hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. I'm mentioning that because one of the things astronomers and biologists also think about is what are other ways to organize life, right? Life on Earth is organized around DNA, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. You can come up with, in your mind, other ways of how we do life, right? And you could think of, say, life on Earth requires water, right? Water is like a suspension all the molecules and all the DNA strands and everything in my body are sort of floating, right? Your cells are filled with water. That's what allows the chemical reactions to take place. Um, and that works because life or water is a very good solvent. A lot of things dissolve in it. But there are other things that you can have, like liquid methane, right? It could act as a solvent in principle. Or instead of phosphorus and DNA, you can have um, like arsenic. That's actually why arsenic is super poisonous to us, because it replaces the phosphorus in that's why it's not good for them, right? But so that's why we say that, um, you know, life on Earth is based on carbon and water, but people are thinking about alternate biologies that don't rely on carbon, don't rely on water. Um, the one problem is, is that we definitely know life on Earth works, right? We know carbon and water work. Um, and when you think about other alternate biologies, like methane and silicate-based or something, um, there are ways to make that work, but there are sort of like little problems on the edges where, you know, maybe it doesn't. So people are thinking about it, but it's not entirely clear that there's an alternative or there's a better alternative to what we have here. Okay, so what about life on other planets? Right, first we need an ocean of some kind. We need lots of liquid water. And uh, ideally we'd also like some land, right? And if you think about that on Earth, we are very finely balanced. If we had a little bit more water, there'd be no land. The oceans would just cover the whole planet. And if we had a little bit less water, there wouldn't really be any oceans. Or they'd be just tiny lakes, and they'd be like hyper saline, super salty lakes. So ideally, we want some kind of oceans, some kind of liquid, because we need this water solvent to be in everything, and we need it to mix around. Um, what that means is that we need to be pretty much at the right temperature, right? We need to be not too cold to ice over. We need to be not too hot to turn into a desert. We don't want to be too close. We don't want to be too far away. We want to be just right, uh, like Goldilocks. Right? We do. So this is why you'll often hear people talk about the habitable zone. It used to be sort of jokingly called the Goldilocks zone, but it's become uh, officialized in the habitable zone. Right? We need planets that are about the right distance from their stars, that liquid water can exist on the surface, that they're at the right temperature. Um, and we actually know of a bunch of these. Right? These are all actually known exoplanets that are, we think are rocky, that are about the right size, and are at about the right distance from their star uh, to have liquid water present on their surface. Um, this one, Proxima b is actually on the closest star to the Earth. Right? It's only four, only four light years away. Meaning if we send a space probe there, it would only take like 60,000 years to get there instead of longer. Um, right? So this is pretty exciting. We actually have a bunch of targets we can go look at. Right? This isn't some nebulous 
theory. We actually know of there's about 30 planets here that are at the right distance, the right size, to have liquid water present on their surface. Okay, so what happens next, right? So we're sort of in this scenario. We have something that's going in front of a star. We know it's the right size. Is it a nice beach vacation or is it Venus, right? So really what we want to do is we want to look for three things if we can measure the atmosphere. We want to look for water because we want to see if there's an ocean. We want to, so at the very least, we want to see water in the atmosphere. It's going to be hard to see the oceans. In principle, we can see water in the atmosphere. Uh, we want to look for oxygen. It's actually one of the primary pieces of evidence that we're looking at Earth. There's life on Earth, the fact there's oxygen in our atmosphere. Uh, and we also want to look for methane, but not too much methane, right? Because that's also produced by biological processes. Um, I'll say just on the not too much, right? One of the problems is, is there's a lot of other ways to make like methane. Like volcanoes make methane. And you can come up with chemical reactions to make oxygen. And you can have water everywhere, right? And so one of the conceptual difficulties that we have is that it's going to be very hard, if somebody actually measures this, right, it's going to be very hard to prove that it's definitively life. Right? It's like the, we're going to be in a Sherlock Holmes scenario, where once you've eliminated everything that's impossible, whatever we made, that's going to be true. Because there's always, the game is going to be, you're going to have to knock out all the possible non-biologic ways in which you can get whatever atmospheric composition we're going to see. And the only thing left is going to be some biological process. It's going to be a very finely, sort of subtle chain of arguments that's going to get us there. Um, and it's going to rely on us understanding biological processes, geological processes, all this stuff, right, that I as an astronomer normally don't think about. Right? I don't have to think about usually plate tectonics. If we're going to do this, we're going to have to understand plate tectonics because that influences the atmosphere. A bit. Okay, so let's talk about oxygen first. Um, so if oxygen is, is a primary biomarker. If we saw oxygen on an Earth-like atmosphere, we would be 90% of the way there. Because right? Earth, before life existed, in the Archean Earth, oxygen was about um, one one-hundredth of a percent. Earth's atmosphere. The air we're breathing right now is about 20% oxygen. That's entirely because of the life present on Earth, right? It's entirely because we're surrounded by trees, and there's a whole ecosphere that's developed around carbon dioxide uh, and photosynthesis and oxygen. If life wasn't present on Earth, there would be no oxygen present in our atmosphere. That's the reason why oxygen is considered a primary biomarker, because it's so prevalent on Earth, but wouldn't be without life. Um, but, uh, you know, there were periods on Earth when oxygen was a lot lower. We're at a pretty high period right now. So we also have to think about scenarios where we're not quite like the Earth. Um, the most promising target for a lot of these observations is what's called the, the TRAPPIST-1 system, which was found by uh, a team run out of Belgium. So they named it after the TRAPPIST beer, the TRAPPIST monks who made beer. Um, so this is a system, the star itself is very small. It's almost not, a, not even a star. Um, and you can see it's much smaller than the solar system. But because the star is so small and so dim, all the planets are really closely packed in. They're sort of huddled next to this really dim star. But a bunch of them, E, F, and G, are at the right distances uh, where they could have liquid water on the surface. And we know all these radii are about the scale. Right? These sizes are about correct. They're all about the same size as the Earth. Um, but I will say, so I worked on, I worked with a team that looked at TRAPPIST-1b, the innermost one, and got atmospheric observations of that one. That one's very hot. We didn't expect it to be like the Earth, uh, but we expected it to have some sort of atmosphere, and what we found was that it was just a bare rock in space. Right? There's no atmosphere at all on the innermost guy. Um, the, there was another team that looked at 1C, the next one out, which they were also hoping was Venus-like. Uh, that turns out probably also is a bare rock in space. So one of the worries is this means that this small star, even though it's really dim, flares a lot. It's had a lot of UV and X-ray, really gnarly stuff. And that may have stripped away most of the atmospheres here. So we'll find out whether or not that's right, probably in a couple of years as more observations. 
Um, and then for a lot of it, uh, you know, a lot of detecting um, Earth-like atmospheres on a lot of these is going to be very difficult because even with Webb, uh, you need, you can sort of see the numbers here. These are the number of transits. You need almost 100 transits. It's just a lot of time to ask for something. So one thing we can think about is what if we don't look exactly for Earth, right? We don't necessarily need to look exactly for Earth. We just need to look for something that could support life. That doesn't necessarily need to be Earth. That could be something much larger than Earth. And a lot of people are thinking about um, what are called Hycean planets that are almost the size of something like Neptune, or sort of maybe actually the, probably about half the size of Neptune. But these are planets where there's no actual solid surface, right? It's a total global ocean. But that's, you know, not great for animals or plants, but it's okay for life, right? Life existed in Earth's oceans for billions of years before it came onto land. So you have liquid water, and then you have this big, thick atmosphere, probably hydrogen, right? It's not an atmosphere like the Earth, but that insulates the ocean and gets it up to the right temperature. And so you can have life, but not really as we know it, right? It's liquid water, insulated from its star, and maybe there's volcanoes on the surface of this thing that are injecting energy to it, just like they do on Earth, and you can have life present in these oceans. Um, just like we do on Earth's oceans. Um, and uh, these are actually very promising because these um, are much larger than the Earth. So this is something we can actually do with telescopes that we have uh, time on through the University of Wisconsin. Right? University of Wisconsin owns time on this telescope. This is the wind telescope on a Kip Peak. Uh, it has a spectrograph on it that is capable of finding planets like these. Uh, and uh, like, we are doing these observations right now, like tonight. Wind's going to be open, and it's going to be observing a whole set of stars for us, uh, looking for more planets like these, these Hycean planets that might uh, have life on them. Um, I actually have a grad student I'm working with who's writing up, who's just about to start writing up a paper where we actually found two of these orbiting around a very bright nearby star uh, that uh, next October, I need him to, he needs to write it up now so we get the paper out. So the next October, we're going to apply for web time to try and look at these things and figure out what their atmospheres are like, right? So we're doing these observations right now. We're like finding more of these things right now, tonight. Um, so like how often do they open it up? And the weather's good, uh, which often it is in Arizona. Uh, yeah, I mean, so you can't, yeah, you can't observe with clouds, but Arizona, like the reason Kid Peak is there because the weather is very good. So they're open probably probably eighty percent of the time. Okay. They open up. Um, it's so just variable. Yeah, it's a little bit seasonal because Arizona is very nice, and then they have what's called the monsoons in the summer. Mm -hmm. So starting like July through sort of start of September, it's usually rainy most days. Um, but the nice thing, actually, the really nice thing about wind and the spectrograph thing is that we don't have to go observe it. We just put in targets on the internet and it gets into their system and then there's people out there who observe for us uh -huh. and so uh, we get emails like i get an email in the morning <coughs> i could probably dig one out of my phone i got one this morning saying we observed two of your targets last night That's so cool. and then uh like a day later the the data gets put on a website that's run out of caltech and we can pull it down okay. and work on it wow uh, yeah it's very civilized yeah right yeah, yeah. <laughs> Organized. Uh, yeah, actually, it's a tremendous resource. It's uh, brought a lot of people to the department. The fact that we own, we have so much time uh, on this telescope. Um, all right. And I mentioned this, right? But the exciting thing is about these things is that you could do this with one to four transits, which is like a reasonable thing you could ask the time committee for, the time allocation committee for, for web. Right? And this is something that's going, right? Like this guy has been observed, they're working, or actually has been written up. This guy has been observed, they're working on the paper. Um, somebody, I think we are probably going to observe for that top one, and then we're finding more that we're also going to look at. Right? So we have what we think is a class of planet that isn't like the Earth, but is very close to the Earth, or not as close to the Earth, but could support life. We think we can actually observe it with telescopes like Webb, and we can find more of them 
using telescopes uh, like WIMP. Right? This is not like a hypothetical, maybe in a decade we'll be able to find life uh, out there. It's something that a lot of people all over the world are like, the race is on, like it's going. Hey, what would James Webb show you that you don't have already? Yeah, so Webb, the things you look for is, um, and for these atmospheres, you look for what's called secondary biosignatures. You wouldn't have something like oxygen, the primary one. You look for other stuff, like this little thing right here, which is labeled DMS, it's dimethyl sulfide. That's a gas that's produced by plankton on Earth. Right? It doesn't really have a geologic way of producing it. Um, and there's a couple of other things here. Uh, what am I looking at? There's CH3Cl, um, OCS maybe. Right? There's other gases here that you would try and see. If, it, if there weren't, wasn't anything here, most of what you'd see is, um, you know, there's probably going to be some methane, probably some water, a little bit of CO2, and a lot of the sort of more complicated molecules are probably not going to be present at concentrations that we detect. So we'd want to look for these really complicated molecules, uh, and if they're at high concentration, that means that something's pumping them out, uh, and odds are that's probably and that's doing what you showed earlier, where it's looking at things like the atmosphere. Yep, exactly yeah. right. Yep. And this is the atmosphere I'm printing on starlight. Mm -hmm. It's filtering through the outer edges. Right, so this, I actually, I like this. I didn't really talk much about this, right? But this is just a nice flow chart from a paper. Uh, right, I like they sort of go through their planets. Does it have water? Is there oxygen? Is there methane? And I like that they end with champagne. Uh, at the end, right, of the final step here for actually finding life uh, somewhere else in the universe. But I said, right, I mentioned that doing this, we're never actually going to be able to prove that it's life, right? We're going to see some molecule in the atmosphere, and there's always probably going to be some scenario where it's a volcano and, like, it's exactly reacting with some very specific mineral, and there's, right, it's going to be a very subtle argument, and we're going to need to understand all these things that astronomers don't normally think about. Right? It's astronomers who are doing these observations, but we're going to need to understand biology, and not just Earth biology. We're going to need to understand biology, like paleobiology. Right? Like what did life used to be before, say, photosynthesis evolved on Earth? What do we think other kinds of biology can look like, and could we find that? How do we think, uh, like, oceans work? Right, like the model I showed you of a Hycean planet, literally all they're doing is just water, right? pure water at the base of that uh, atmosphere when they try and simulate it. But, you know, you go to anybody who works on oceans and they say that's insane, like that's nuts. The ocean, the Earth is not just pure water, there's lots of stuff in it, and that stuff interacts with the atmosphere, it changes stuff. We need to understand oceans, we need to understand geology, we need to understand plate tectonics, volcanoes, lots of stuff. I understand how James Webb works. I don't understand how volcanoes work. It's not at the level necessary to do this and really drill down and figure out what's going on. Um, which almost at the end, goes to um, this new center we're starting actually this summer. This logo actually, we just got, I just got an email with this logo about a week ago. Um, uh, and it's something called uh, y -Core for short. Right? Wisconsin Center for Origins Research. Uh, what we're trying to do is get together all those departments, right? Not just astronomy, but chemistry and geoscience and bacteriology and oceanography, everybody that's at the university, and try and get everybody together talking so that we can understand what we need to learn, what do we need to figure out now to really get a definitive detection of life, and what can we look for now to see if we can actually find it. Right? How can we get better ideas of what we should be looking for, and when we find it, how do we prove that it's life? And how do we get everybody together to talk about that in a constructive way, uh, in a way that makes sense? Okay, so I'm going to end uh, just on this picture again. Right? So I was saying at the beginning that it's been like 3,000 years at least that people have been thinking about whether or not there's life somewhere else in the universe. And we now, over the last decade and a bit, has, have developed the techniques that are capable of doing this. We've built machines, we've built observatories like Webb, we've built the spectrograph out on Kitt Peak. We can 
find planets like this, uh, and we can actually do this. Right? It's been 3,000 years of people wondering about whether or not there's life elsewhere in the universe. And we are really searching for it right now as we speak. Right? They're probably opening in Arizona in about two hours. And they're going to look for planets. And then we're going to propose for it and hopefully get time and look at their atmospheres. So I think that we are very close to actually being able to detect life in the next like couple of years. And like I said, there's not a lot of ways to win astronomy. But I'm hopeful by maybe the end of the decade, or at least in 10 years, Somebody somewhere will actually want it uh, and detect the life somewhere else. Uh, which is why it's a very exciting time to be working on it. Uh, there's tons of interesting stuff coming out. Uh, that's why, I don't know, I like doing these talks too to tell everybody about it. So I will stop there and take questions, but I think we've been doing pretty well with the questions. I've been doing well.